Brucham Aboim, again, thank you very much for coming to our house with the new normal. And uh, again, we're between the period between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And these are called the 10 days of repentance. So, our lecture today will be only five more days. Five more days to we enter the holiest and the holiest time of the year. Question is, are you ready? <laughs> I wish I could say that I am. What a year. It didn't start that way, not the way that it ended. Who would have believed all those plans, all those worries and concerns? Many people, many have pushed back, of the, many of our plans have been pushed back and others that seemed so important at the time are no longer relevant. So the question becomes, is this a punishment from God? As the whole world sins so grievously, that we all deserve to be punished in one form or another through this one virus? Or is this just a sign of the beginning of the Armageddon? It's very strange. You know, that in previous times, whenever there was an outside threat to a family, a city, or a nation, everyone seemed to forget about their personal differences and unite against the common enemy. Race, religion, color, creed, gender, financial status, age, None of these things made any difference whatsoever. All that mattered was the family, the city, the nation, the world, all united. We had to unite against the common enemy so that we could concede, so that we could all live. Think of 9-11. The Twin Towers went down. But the spirit of patriotism that was felt throughout this country rose to the heavens. We, all of us, were united as one. There was no color, no race, no religion, age or financial disparities. We were all Americans and we had been violated. It felt personal to all of us. It was an awesome, awesome moment in time, a time to remember. Going back to where we were before this pandemic, is never an option. Every experience in life is really an opportunity for growth. The deeper the valley, the higher the mountain. What we, ex what we are experiencing now is Death Valley. We can only imagine how high we will climb after we have beat this virus. This ascent will come about because of the feeling of success that we will feel if we act as one unit what is called in Hasidus as the arida for an aliyah, a descent for a higher ascent. This pandemic has been horrific. Many people have suffered deep losses. Consciously and with a sense of deep appreciation, we should all not just come together, but stay together. You know, better an insincere peace than a sincere war. We don't have to love each other, but we do need to accept each other and find common ground. The Declaration of Independence, authored by Thomas Jefferson, states that all men are created equal. The Hebrew Torah of the Bible states, man was created but selim elokim, in the image of God. That doesn't mean that each one of us is a carbon copy of each other. What it does mean is that each one of us has within us a spark of God, a spark of divinity that gives us our life force. You know, it's an interesting fact that no matter what color your skin is, black, white, brown, yellow, red, on the inside, we're all the same color. Not only that, if you were born normal, we all have the same number of limbs and organs. Many times these organs are interchangeable from one human being to another, regardless of race, religion, or color. If they are incompatible, it may be due to other reasons such as genetics. As I mentioned before in the first blessing of the prayers of the Amida, the standing prayer, the holiest of the prayers that we recite at least three times daily, we mention the names of the forefathers of the Jewish nation. We say, Loke Avraham, Loke Yitzchak, Loke Yaakov, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, 
The question that is asked is, why repeat the name of God after each of the fathers? Why not just say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? It would mean exactly the same. But the wording is very concise, and it teaches us a great lesson in life. The name of God is placed before each of the fathers to teach us that each one of them served God with his own special uniqueness. Abraham, through the attribute of kindness. Isaac, through the attribute of severity. And Jacob, through the attribute of truth. We are all part of what would be somewhat of a giant jigsaw puzzle. If you have two pieces that are identical, it's useless. You throw one away. Each person that has or is walking on this earth is unique, both in the eyes of God and in the eyes of man. You know, though we may be the same on the inside, on the outside, we're all very different, so to speak, our gift wrapping. Each one of us has unique fingerprint, facial features, and voice. God has choreographed for each and every person who has ever lived a specific mission tailored only for them. We see a proof of this from the Torah. Medrash tells us that Moshe, Moses our teacher, argued with God for seven days before he agreed to accept his mission to take the children of Israel out of Egypt. But why? Why would God have to argue with any person? After all, God can create whatever and whomever he chooses. So how are we to understand this Medrash? Says in Pirkei Avot, chapter 1, 14, Hillel said, Im anani li me li. If I'm not from myself, then what am I? God argued with Moshe because that was his mission in life. And every event in Moshe's life up to that point had led him to this moment in time, to his destiny, Moshe's destiny, no one else's. The same fact holds true for each and every one of us and our special mission on this earth. You know, social distancing has become a reality of time. How does that connect to God and our spiritual mission? We have been told by health and community leaders to practice social distancing, keeping a distance of six feet on all sides between individuals. In Jewish law, this six feet separation would be called dalanamus, four cubits, an area of approximately 36 square feet. God is giving each and every member of the human race an opportunity to go back to basics. He wants us to change the only thing in this world that we actually have the ability to change, six feet, ourselves. You know, the number 36 is twice the numerical value of the word, Hebrew word, chai, life. If we succeed, we'll be rewarded with both life in this world and in the world to come. I heard a story told of Reb Ruderman. It was the Rosh Hashiva, the head of Nair Israel Rabbinical College in Baltimore. He survived the Holocaust, but he lost his entire family. And when he came to Baltimore after the war, he made up his mind that he would change the world. He didn't succeed. So he decided that he would change the United States. Again, he failed. Not one to give up, he decided to change the city of Baltimore. He was not successful. So then he felt he should at least change his family, and once again, he failed. Dejected and discouraged, he gathered himself together and decided that he would change the one thing in life that he could actually change, himself. He said of himself that after I changed myself somehow, and in some way, I've changed my family, my city, my country, and my world. This pandemic is not a punishment from an angry God. No, it's a wake-up call from a loving Father. We all need to do better on all levels of the world and society at large. But the only way we can succeed is to go back to basics. We need to start with ourselves. We need to take stock of that six-foot area that we occupy, our 36 square feet. We need to remember that we live in a dangerous world. There are many things that threaten our lives daily. We have learned to live with them and make the most out of the years that we have on this earth. Fear and panic are the worst things that we can do. 
It takes away any quality of existence. It's a life, a life without living. Think of it. Last year, there were six million car accidents in the United States. Six million. Out of that number, three million people were injured. Two million sustained some permanent bodily damage. And over 43,000 people died in car-related accidents. These figures are shocking. And based on how we reacted to the pandemic, it would seem to be only logical that the government should confiscate all of our motor vehicles and replace them with bicycles or tricycles. The other option, of course, would be you could always walk every place you had to go. Yeah, I know. It's ridiculous. Vehicle safety is and has been an important issue, and many strides have been made to increase vehicle safety. Though we have made strides, people continue to die and sustain serious injuries. Giving up our motor vehicles, though, is not an option. And so we work on safety and accept what the reality will be. But we continue to live. We pray, of course, that we do not become a statistic. You know, if you text, excuse me, if you text and drive, the odds of you getting into an accident are one in four. But people, do, people who do text while they're driving don't believe it's gonna to happen to them. And I find it interesting that if one takes proper precautions, the odds of contracting this virus is really very small. Yet people are worried more about a virus than texting while driving. So the advice given to the public is follow the science, listen to the doctors and the experts. I think this is, that advice is solid and, should, and one should always seek out the greatest experts on any subject that one sees as important, especially when it connects with life and death. And based on that logic, during this time of judgment, we, was, we must seek out advice of the spiritual experts and follow their direction. The Talmud in Rosh Hashanah 16 states, a person is judged on Rosh Hashanah only, only in accordance with his present actions. What does that actually mean? The Talmud is telling us that though one may be immersed in sin all year, God testifies that the people of Israel desire to do his will so on the day of judgment, when they repent, they do tshuva, and they do the will of God, they are judged as they are right now, not as they were throughout the year. So how do we understand this Talmud? It, it is telling us that even if a person has sinned all year, he should not give up hope in his capacity for tshuva, for repentance. Instead, let him return to the way of righteousness before he comes to judgment. Let him believe in his heart that he is always capable of tipping the scale of merit for himself and the entire world. Based on this fact, many Jews increase their charity and good deeds and other mitzvot in a greater degree from Rosh Hashanah until after Yom Kippur, more so than during the remainder of the year. In fact, many religious Jews take on stringencies during this 10-day period, such as only eating what they call pas Yisrael, only bread baked by a Jewish baker and other stringencies that they might not do the rest of the year. So in plain English, God judges a person as he acts during the 10 days of repentance, not as he acted throughout the rest of the year. Huh, really? That seems strange. So how are we to understand this statement? Just be good for 10 days. That's it. You know, it sounds a lot easier than it is. Trying to act like a righteous individual for 10 days you know, many people may start, but few have the fortitude to stay the course for the whole 10 days. It may seem like an eternity. Okay, it takes some discipline to stay the course, but, but, but what about the rest of the year? You know, they tell a story about a thief who started to have pangs of guilt about his lifestyle. And he felt a desire to repent. However, he was logical and in a crazy way an honest thief. He went to see a great rabbi and stopped him in the middle of his study hall. The thief told the rabbi that he wanted to do tshuva, he wanted to repent, but he, he said he knew himself and felt that it would be almost impossible for him to keep all 613 commandments, in addition to all the rabbinic decrees that are set. The rabbi nodded, nodded his head and asked the thief, can you keep one mitzvah? The thief looked at the rabbi in disbelief. 
One mitzvah? Sure. I can do that. No problem. The rabbi said, fine. One mitzvah. From now on, you must always tell the truth. You can never lie. The thief looked at the rabbi and said, that's it? The rabbi smiled and nodded his head. The thief left the study hall, happy as a lark. Skip ahead one year. A stranger enters the same study hall of the rabbi. He is wearing a black suit, white shirt, black hat, and has a beard. In short, he was dressed up as a religious Jew. The Hasidim looked slowly, probably closely at him because there was something about him that looked familiar. He smiled at them and said, don't you recognize me? He said that he was the same thief that had visited the Rebbe last year. They were really confused. They said, the Rebbe told you that all you have to do is keep one mist to look at you. You've been completely transformed into a new person. But how? He told them. He said that after he had left the Rebbe, he was on his way to burglarize John's house. On the way, he bumped into his friend Harry. Harry asked him, where are you going? He was about to make up something. But then he remembered his promise to the Rebbe. And so he told him the truth. He was on his way to burglarize John's house. He continued with the story and he said, and as I was approaching John's house, I met another friend of mine and he asked me, where was I going? And again, I had to tell him the truth. By the time I had told two people about my illegal intentions, <laughs> so I just went home. Once I stopped lying, somehow it changed my life. <clears throat> and one thing led to another. And here I am, an Orthodox Jew. The power of one, one person, one mitzvah. We can never be sure just which act that we perform in our lives will give us the most benefit. Sometimes the smallest of actions can bring about the greatest of results. We see in the Olympics, one one hundredth of a second can make the difference between receiving a medal or not. To triumph can mean to try with a little more oomph. Today we see the negative power of one, one woman working in one laboratory in one city in China, which has infected almost 30 million people worldwide and killed another million. The act of one person has affected the lives of 7.7 .7 billion people, the whole world. We pray to God that one person, the Messiah, will come and counteract all the sickness and negativity in the world and bring peace and joy in its stead. We can also look at these 10 days in a sense as therapeutic, spending these days in a state of spiritual purity, much like going to a health spa where one would receive treatments whose benefits would extend throughout the whole year. Yet there is yet another way of looking at these 10 days of repentance. Imagine if you saved your money and planned a 10 day vacation. If your vacation is a success, then all your efforts, preparations and expenses were all worthwhile. It somehow gives purpose and joy to the rest of the year. But the opposite is also true. What if the vacation is a disaster? What if it did not live up to your expectations? Then that negativity may well have a lasting effect, a feeling of regret, a dark cloud that may hover over you for the rest of the year. You know, the high holidays are a wake-up call for the world to get it together. We blow the chauffeur, the ram's horn, is a call to battle, calling out to all our faculties to arise and stand firm against the forces that drive us away from our relationship with our Father in heaven. As I've stated many times in my thoughts, numbers in Judaism make a difference. They are not just random. The numerical value of the Hebrew word shofar, the horn, is 586. There are many illusions that we can draw from this numerical value. 586 is the same numerical value as the Hebrew words by Yom Mim or by Leilot, by day and by night. Serving God is not a day job. We are always connected to Him. We are like servants to a king and we must serve Him both day and night. We are on call 24-7. 586 is all of the Gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew words, Gulas Olam, the redemption of the world, a constant theme found in our prayers. In fact, in the standing prayer that we say, out of the original 12 requests, six 
our requests for the coming of the Messiah. The words David, Mashiach, Tzikach, Tzikach, David, our righteous Savior, again, 586. The phrase, Velo voyed, and his light will never be extinguished, meaning God, 586. That the whole world shall tremble before him, before God Almighty, 586. Who is similar to you, who can be compared to you. Mole Shira, again, filled with stone, 586. And then Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, without the Yud, again, 586. All these statements have, again, that gematria. They all are connected in some way to the theme of the holiday and to the call of repentance, of tshuva. The blowing of the shofar, a wake-up call that reaches deep within our souls and hopefully inspires us to do better, to be better, to feel better about our lives and our relationship with our King, our Father, the Creator of the world. For centuries, we as Jews have been waiting for the coming of the Messiah. There is a measure that states when he comes, he'll be riding on a donkey. <laughs> a donkey? Really? We would have expected him to come riding in a stretch limousine. So how are we supposed to understand this medrash in our day and time, riding on a donkey? So the word Hebrew word chamor, donkey, can also be read as the Hebrew word chamar, meaning physical matter. The word has a numerical value of 248, which corresponds to the 248 positive commandments in the Torah. And as I mentioned before, nothing is an accident. So what do we learn from this numerical value? There are two types of Torah commandments, positive things we are supposed to do and negative things we are supposed to abstain from. There are 248 positive commandments and 365 negative commandments. Repentance, tshuva, for a negative commandment has an added bonus in that if one is able to repent out of love, not only is their sin forgiven, <clears throat> but that same sin, that transgression, can be transformed into a mitzvah, a good deed, and a reward. However, this is only true when one commits an action that is prohibited by God. However, when one transgresses a positive commandment, if he, is, if he has abstained from performing an act which God has commanded, he's done no action. He has created nothing. And so there's nothing for him to go back and correct. He had an opportunity, and he wasted it. He did nothing. More often than not, doing nothing is the worst action that one can take. At least try. You might be surprised at what you might be able to accomplish. You may not be able to correct the past, but you can use it as a springboard to do better in the future. So when the measure says that the Messiah will come in riding on a chamor, a donkey, it may not be referring to the donkey, but rather that his coming will be a result of our adherence and fulfillment of the 248 positive commandments in the Torah. Doing an action. That, that, is, that is really the order of the day. Sure, think about it. Talk about it. But if these do not connect to a decisive action, a call to action, then you have been outwitted by the devil. In fact, he may well be the one who is encouraging you to think about it and talk about it. He knows that then you will feel self-righteous, and there'll be no necessity for you to repent, change your ways. You know, there's a story told, in fact, it's a true story, of Isaac ben Yeklis, who built a, a synagogue in Krakow in the 16, late 1600s. The story goes that Isaac was a very, very poor man, but a great believer in God. And even though he had little to sustain himself or his family, he always believed that God would supply one day, one night, he had a dream, a recurring dream, that if he, were to go to, if he would go to Prague underneath the bridge that led to the palace, he would find great treasure. And as he had the dream again and again, he finally decided he would go to Prague. Didn't know what he would do, but, and it was a journey. It wasn't around the corner. And he had to walk and hitch rides, whatever, to get there. He finally got there and he went to the bridge and it was a large expanse bridge that led to the palace. 
and on the bridge were armed soldiers guarding the palace. And he came day after day, and finally after a week, trying to figure out from some sign of what to look for, which he didn't know, the captain of the guard approached Isaac. He said, Sir, I see you here all week. What's your business? Isaac was an honest man. He said, I had a dream that somewhere here under this bridge is my treasure, and I've come. The captain of the guard looked at Isaac and smiled. You fool. I too have had a dream, day after day, night after night. And in my dream, it says that if I go to the house of Isaac, then the Echolus, and if I move his stove underneath his stove, I'll find buried treasure. Do you see me going to find Isaac and the ex -Echolus? And as he turned, the captain turned around, Isaac was gone on his way home. And when he got home without saying anything to his family, he quickly moved over the stove and began to dig. And within a few minutes, he hit something that was hard, and sure enough, there was buried treasure underneath the stove. So both Isaac and the captain of the guard had a dream. They both thought about their dream. In fact, they both talked about it. The captain of the guard, even though his dream contained the information that was necessary to find the treasure, he never acted on it. But Isaac didn't just think or talk about it. He turned his thoughts into action, and he prospered greatly. And so too with our repentance. Thinking about it and talking about it isn't good enough. You are just being outsmarted by the evil inclination. He has convinced you that thinking and talking are enough to wipe away the feelings of guilt and make you feel confident and self-righteous. In addition, praying for ourselves has very little effect unless they are prayers that are accompanied with true contrition and with tears. We have overdrawn our spiritual bank accounts a long time ago. We are living on the extended credit that God has graciously lent us. However, we do have the ability and responsibility to pray for others, especially for those who are in need of those same blessings that we wish for ourselves. Pray for them. Pray for them first. And God may well grant you your needs even before he extends his blessings to them. So remember in your prayers to address God as your loving Father. One of the most powerful prayers we recite during the holidays is of Vinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King. You know, we may be lacking in our service to our King, and for that we need to repent and try to do better. But in the end, He is our Father, and whether we are good or not, whether we deserve His love and assistance or not, he is our Father, and a father has a responsibility not only to love, but to help his child in any and every way possible. Much like our father Yitzchak, who loved Esau, not for any reason other than he was his son. A father does not need a reason to love his son. In fact, many times, the less the reason, the greater the love, because then there exists a greater need. So what should our prayers consist of, especially this year? Pray for God. Really, for God. You know, when the Jewish nation was forced to go into exile, so too was the Shekhinah, the divinity of God, forced. It was forced to accompany us into this long exile. We should pray that the Messiah should come so that this exile will end. And then we can all accompany the Shekhinah on its return to Israel with Mashiach Tzikeno, and the final redemption, quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. We wish you all a happy and healthy year, a successful year, a safe year, but a year that we all grow. We cannot go back to things as normal. Normal wasn't good enough. Again, we need to look within our hearts and to help others as well to see this and try to make the world a better place, a place not only where we can feel comfortable, so to our Father in heaven. Thank you very much. God bless and be well.